Good morning, Bethel family. Good morning. It is good to be back Amen. in the house of God. Um, I send greetings from my home church, Audacious Manchester. It's lovely to see so many familiar faces and new ones. Uh, today, my message to you is entitled Addicted to Jesus, <laughs> True Vine Disciples Abide. In this message, I aim to answer some key questions. What is the parable of the vine and branches? Where and when is it set? What does the word abide mean? What are the two types of branches? What is the importance of abiding in the vine? What happens when you don't abide? How do we abide in the vine? What fruit pleases God? And why does God want us to bear fruit? More fruit and much fruit. Let us pray. Father, I thank you. You are Yahweh, covenant-keeping God, prayer-answering God. I pray, Lord, that you empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit, that I may deliver your word in effectively, in clarity, and in boldness. I pray for every heart listening will be fertile ground where your word will take root and bear much fruit. He that has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. So could we all stand for the reading of God's word? If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of John. If you have your phones, click on to John 15, verses 1 to 11. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the wine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit in itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they are gathered them and throw them in the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done to you, for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord, for your word. If you notice in this passage, there are 11 verses, and the word that keeps coming up over and over again is the word abide. It occurs 11 times, I counted. Um, so the word, this whole theme is about abiding, abiding in the true vine, Jesus Christ. Before I delve further, I just want to remind you of the context in which this parable sits. This is the last parable Jesus shared with his disciples. 
before he was arrested, before he was flogged, before he was crucified and died. So what happened just before that? Well, the scene unfolds on a Thursday night. The place is the upper room. Jesus has just washed his disciples' feet. He has instituted Holy Communion. He instituted that, the Last Supper, as a lasting memorial for us to remember him. But Jesus was troubled in his spirit that night. And he said, one of you will betray me. Now these 12 disciples have been following Jesus. They have been eating with Jesus, sleeping with Jesus, walking with Jesus. You know, they were present when all the miracles were being done. But they didn't know who it was. So everyone started saying, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? And of course, the impulsive apostle of all, Peter, he just says, he kind of motioned to John, who was lying on Jesus' bosom. He said, ask. So John asked the Lord, who is it, Lord? And the Lord said, it is the one that I dip this piece of bread and give it to. And so Jesus dipped the piece of bread and he gave it to Judas Iscariot. And the Bible says, Satan entered him. And Jesus said, do what you do, go quickly. And so now Judas has defected. Yeah? And Jesus has got his 11 closest few with him. And so he speaks about, you know, his new commandment of love. Then he tells them about the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And then he talks about his imminent death. And the last verse in chapter 14 is, Arise, let us go from here. And this is where our parable sits. It happened somewhere between leaving the upper room and en route to the Garden of Gethsemane. Imagine, Jesus knows what is ahead of him. Time is of the essence. Jesus has got some very important home truths to share with his closest 11 disciples. So Jesus is using parables, he's using word pictures to drive home the meaning, the importance of his message. This is the last parable and Jesus wants his disciples to remember and not forget. He uses an agricultural context, he uses true vine, yeah? He's talking about the vine dresser, he speaks about branches, he speaks about fruit. So what does the word abide mean? It means to remain, to stay, to dwell, to stay connected. It is a deep, enduring connection. It is more than just a casual acquaintance with the Lord. It's a deep, enduring connection. Abiding in Christ involves constant, constant communion with Him. 24-7, 24, you know, there's 24 hours in a day, every minute of every day, being conscious of his presence, he is with you and communicating with him. Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I suggest to you the secret place is Jesus. That's your address. That's where you live. That's where you stay. That's where you remain. In the Bible, there are a lot of examples of mentor-mentee relationship, and I'm just going to give you a few. Moses and Joshua. Now, Joshua is a young aide. He followed Moses everywhere. He abided with Moses. He learned leadership from Moses. He learned faith. And eventually, as a result of him abiding. I mean, you know, in the tabernacle of meeting, when everybody left, Joshua remained. When Moses went up the mountain, Joshua was not far behind. So as a result of that, he went on to succeed Moses and lead the people into the promised land. 
Another example is the prophet Elijah and Elisha. Elisha was a devoted disciple of Elijah. He followed Elijah very closely. He wanted a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. So everywhere Elijah went, Elisha followed. You know, Elijah, Elijah the prophet knew that God was going to take him home. So he said to Elisha, stay, please stay. I must needs go to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So, okay, so he follows, yeah? Another time too, he didn't do it once, he did it many times. Another time Elijah says, stay here please. I must needs go to Jericho. And again, Elisha said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And in the end, because of his abiding, he was there when the chariots of God came to take Elisha home. The robe fell and he caught the double portion. He caught the robe and he got the double portion of Elijah's anointing. Another, this is the final one, the um, relationship. It's not mentor mentee in a traditional sense. It is Naomi and Ruth. Ruth had two daughters and two sons. They died, so the daughters-in-law, she thought, okay, you better go back to your, you know, your people. Go back to your family. Orpah chose to go back, but Ruth abided. Ruth said, I will not leave you. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. As a result of her abiding, she married Boaz, yeah? And she became the great mother of King David. And we all know King David, the lineage of Jesus, yeah? Jesus came from that lineage. Now, you know what Jesus said? I am the true vine. It implies there are other types of vine. Degenerate vine, false vine, fake vine, okay? Jesus said, I am the true vine, the real McCoy. Okay, I am the real deal. So my question to you, brothers and sisters, who or what are you abiding in? Where are you dwelling? Where are you remaining? Who are you connected to? Have a close, intimate relationship with. Who do you spend time with the most? Who or what are you hooked up with? Who or what are you addicted to that you cannot live without? You must have, you must be with. Think for a moment. Is it the internet, your mobile phone? It pings so, you abide so much, you just have to answer. Are you soaking up everything in so social media? What it's selling you? Are you buying? Are you eating that? Are you dwelling there? Okay, TV, Netflix. Is that where you're living? Some of you may be hooked up to sport and there's nothing wrong with sport. Everything has its place, but the degree. I know of Manchester United followers, ardent fans. My, okay, Liverpool, whichever. You know, they, they follow their team. They know everything about their team. They're season, you know, holders, season ticket holders. They buy all the merchandise. They even train their children from baby to wear the t-shirt. Red, if you are Manchester United, you're red. If you're Man City, you're blue. The two don't mix. You know, in the recent FIFA games, they followed their team. They don't have money, they will borrow. 
and they would buy t a ticket to get to Germany to follow their team. That's how committed, how much they abide with their, you know, for me, is their God. There are people that are hooked up or hooked on to alcohol. Get up in the morning, they must drink. Where is that booze? In the afternoon, that's their diet. And at night, they cannot live without alcohol. They cannot live without cigarettes. Vape. Get up in the morning, first thing, vape. They're living, they're abiding in that. Some are abiding in pornography. Yeah? They just need, that is what sustains them. That is what gives them a kick, a buzz. Some are abiding, don't get me wrong, in their office. Everything is about making money, more money, more money. They want to get connected in, in that. They're dwelling there, they're remaining there. Hear me very, very clearly here. The thing, person, and activity you spend most time with, you possess and it possesses you. The thing, person, and activity you spend most time with, you possess and it possesses you. Now this is a picture of my grapevine in Manchester. My son helped me plant it uh, six years ago and I had an abundant harvest, harvest last year. This line, verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. It puzzled me as a young Christian. God, take away, remove. But actually, as I researched, do you know the New Testament was written in Greek? The word take away or the phrase take away means airo, A-I-R-O. It means to lift up to uphold, to elevate. So when Father God, the vine dresser, sees a branch that is fallen, that is grappling on the ground, vine branches can go on the ground. Yes. He will lift it gently, elevate it, uphold it, and place it back on the trellis to nurture it to grow. Fruit takes time to manifest. So don't judge others. Not all branches in the vine produce fruit at the same time. Some branches in the vine will produce fruit earlier than the rest, and some later. Branches in the vine will bear fruit in its season. The amount of fruit one branch bears varies to the next. Some will bear 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. So in John 15 verse 2, God is speaking about two branches. It's all about abiding branches, but some have no fruit yet. And some branches have fruit. To both these abiding branches, Father God, the vine dresser, will tend to. The branch that has no fruit yet, he iros, yeah? He lives, he elevates, he upholds, and he places it back on the vine to twine around the vine so that it can get maximum sunlight, maximum support. When it gets maximum sunlight, maximum support, it will bear fruit. The Bible says, in Isaiah 42, verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. So, don't be discouraged if you fall in your walk with the Lord, if you sin, if you made a mistake, and or if you've not started to bear fruit. Father God will not leave you be. Amen. Once you are in Christ, the true vine, once you're hid in Christ, 
You are the righteousness of God. Amen. In due season, you will bear fruit. Amen. That is guaranteed. Yeah? Don't be discouraged if a loved one has wandered away. He knew the Lord and he's wandered away. Pray them back in. Get on your knees and pray. Pray God open their eyes. Cause them to hunger and thirst for you. Cause them to return. They will return. Not because of all your prayers and what. It's because of God's faithfulness. The good work that he has begun. He is faithful to complete. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. So we're talking about the abiding branches. Yeah. So we've, we've covered the branches that are not bearing fruit. Father God will iro. Yeah. He will elevate. Then there's the other branches, like good branches, bearing fruit already. What does Father God do? He prunes. Pruning is sake, painful, uncomfortable. Yeah. We don't like to be pruned, but we pray prayers. Lord, I want more of your presence in my life. Lord, I want to walk in you. I completely surrender. We say all these prayers. They are good prayers. So when you do that, don't be shocked when suddenly you get some hardship. Suddenly you encounter some rejection, some perse persecution or trial comes your way. The more we desire Jesus, the more we want to walk in his will. Amen. Father God will prune. What is he pruning? He's removing the deadness. The things that are not profitable for you. The things that do not look like Jesus in you. It needs to be removed. Pruned. So, the more we desire to be with Jesus, the more we will be abide in him. The more we commune with Jesus, the bigger our royal connectivity cable. The strength of our connectivity really depends on our first level, on our hunger level. The degree of your thirst, the degree of your hunger is the amount of fruit you will bear. The more hungry you are, the more you ask God, come prove me, take away everything that is not Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. Then you will bear much fruit for him. And the last point I want to raise is the contrast between verse 2 and verse 6. We mustn't confuse the two. Both are talking about branches. But verse 6 is speaking about non-abiding people, non-abiding branches. They are like withered branch. They're dead, they're barren, they have no life. These branches are gathered, they are thrown in the fire and burnt. Verse 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they are gathered, all the non-abiding branches are gathered, thrown and in the fire and they are burnt. So this is what the angels will come and do. So these branches are the non-abiding branches. So what is the characteristics of abiding branches and non, in contrast, non-abiding branches? The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. All those people that have, have accepted Jesus as Lord are the abiding branches. They are hid in Christ. They are hid in the true vine, in the ark. They are remaining in the secret place. All of them are saved. Nothing can pluck them from God's hand. 
once you have a covenant relationship with Jesus, for God is faithful, as I said earlier, the good work that he has begun in you, he will complete. He is Yahweh, our covenant keeping God. When he cuts a covenant, he is true to his word. Amen. So, you know the disciples, who are the true disciples? These are the, those who confess and believe that Jesus is God. Not a teacher, not an inspirational speaker, not just a prophet. He is God. They possess Jesus and they have a lot of faith in him. Pastor talked about, you know, just it has to have congruence. What we say and how we live. We make Jesus our home. He's our secret place. We dwell there 24-7. We follow Jesus. I mean, follow means really follow. How? Obey his word. Sometimes? All the time. And immediately, if Jesus said something, do it. In him, we live. In Jesus, we live. In Jesus, we move. In Jesus, we have our being. Amen. True disciples are totally dependent on Jesus. Amen. Totally. They die to self every day. Jesus said, take up the cross, my cross, and follow me. So they are dead to self. You know, we sing, it's no longer I that live but Christ that liveth in me. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. We sing that, right? When you say, it's no longer I that lives. The life that I live now, I live through faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you are dead, right? Caroline, you're dead. But I'm alive in Jesus because Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. So, true disciples, they are hot for Jesus. They are not cold. They are not lukewarm. Jesus wants the Laodicean church. I know your works. I'd rather you be hot or cold, but not lukewarm. He'll spew you out. Amen. So what Jesus is wanting is for us to grow. Once we are in the Lord, we cannot stagnate. We must grow. We must start producing good fruit. Not enough. More fruit. Much fruit. There is a progression. There is an increase. We are constantly aiming for higher ground. We want to be where Jesus is all the time. In contrast, we have the fake disciples, the false disciples. I mean, Judas is a classic example. He was with Jesus since the beginning. He literally lived with Jesus, ate with Jesus, slept with Jesus, saw all the miracles. He also had a very, very high position. He was the treasurer. And remember I said, the Last Supper at that time, nobody knew who the fake disciple was. Everybody said, is it I, is it I? Yeah? Mm. So we have fake disciples, false disciples in churches. Whoa. It's scary. Right. They follow Jesus superficially. Yeah? They attend church, a social club. They play Christianity. They know how to say the amen, hallelujah, at the right time. Dress, oh, like how Christians supposed to be. All in the outward. But what God is looking is at the heart. So they profess Jesus. Jesus is Lord, yeah? And they deny his power. You know, we can teach a parrot to say Jesus is Lord. Yeah? Do you remember the sons? of the high priests, the sons of Sceva, the seven. Yes. Yeah? Yes. They are trying to cast out this demon using Jesus' name, thinking it's a magic. <laughs> hmm? And what did the demon re respond? He said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, 
who are you? Got a nice whacking, walloping, and came out naked. That was the result. So, false disciples may have an outward appearance, Christian, quote unquote, they do not die to self. They dip in and out of the church when it suits them. What portion of scripture they like, they hold on to. The other one, nah. Just, yeah, cherry picking indeed. Yeah, they, they do not believe that Jesus is Lord of all. They don't obey Jesus' word totally. Now, Jesus wants total commi commitment, total obedience, immediate obedience. They do half-heartedly, a little bit, whatever suits them. They live stagnated lives, no growth. They either cold or lukewarm. Hmm? We touch the temperature, not hot. So Jesus said, in the last days, many will come and say, Lord, Lord, I healed in your name. I did this miracle in your name. But Jesus will say, I never knew you. That is a scary thought. So what is the importance of abiding in the true vine? When we abide in Jesus, you know he is your all sufficiency. Just as a branch cannot live without the vine. We cannot have true spiritual life apart from Jesus. He is our sustenance. He is our nourishment. He is our strength. He is our wisdom. He is our all sufficiency. He is our source of life, the fountain of living water. So, as a result of abiding in the true vine, there is bound to be fruitfulness in our life. Jesus said, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. This is guaranteed because apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. So our ability to bear fruit evidences a Christ-like life, such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's all entirely dependent on our connection and strength of connection to Him. Remember Jesus, the bigger your royal cable, the more access you have, the more power you have, the more strength you have, and as a result, more fruit. The smaller your royal cable, less access, less power, less strength, less fruit. So it all depends on your connectivity and level of abiding in Christ. It all depends on how hungry you are for Jesus, how thirsty you are for Jesus. When we abide in Jesus, we have answered prayers. Abiding in Jesus aligns us to His will. So when we pray, we are praying in the will of God. When our will aligns with God's will, our prayers guarantee will be answered. Now when we're in harmony with Christ, our desires will reflect His will and all our prayers will become powerful and effective. Amen. Um, the thing that we've been singing this morning is joy, all about joy. What jo Jesus promises us that abiding in Him will bring us complete joy. Jesus said, I told you this so my joy may remain in you and your joy may be complete. So true joy is in a close relationship with Jesus, regardless of the external circumstance. Now we're not talking about happiness here. Joy and happiness, you all know, is a big difference. Happiness 
is based on happenstance. Okay? He got a promotion, pay raise. Oh, I'm so happy. Suddenly lost your job. Ah, oh, yeah. So sad. Like a yo-yo, up and down, up and down your life goes. But Jesus said, you can have my joy in the midst of trial, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of hardship. You know there is a peace. You know Paul and Silas, they had that joy, that peace, when they were in jail. When you abide in Jesus, your joy will be full regardless of what is happening around you because we walk by faith and not by sight we trust in god our eyes are on jesus all the time amen so what happens when we don't abide in the vine very short answer if you are not in christ there's only one way you're going it's hell this is a stark warning. When we are not in the ark, when we are not hid in Christ, when we do not dwell in the secret place of the Most High, when we don't abide in Christ, we are like the withered branch that has no life, that is dead. The angels of God will come, gather those non-abiding branches, cast them into hellfire, and they will be burnt. So brothers and sisters, we are living in the 11th hour. Jesus' return is imminent. He is coming this time, not as the Lamb of God. He is coming as judge. So many, many souls are perishing. They are taking the wide road which will lead to death and destruction. May God give us a burden for souls. Let us pray that all those who do not know Jesus in our families, in our community, in our nation, in the world to be saved. Let us be soul winners and win more for Jesus. Amen. Amen. So how do we abide, abide in the true vine? There are some practical things you can do. I mean, just saying the word abide, remain in God, it doesn't mean go up to Nepal or the Himalayas and sit and go, oh, I'm abiding, I'm staying, I'm living. No, no, no. God wants you to be in the marketplace. God wants you to be in the community. God wants you to get up from your bed, leave the house, meet with people. Yeah, but you are conscious of his presence every moment of every day. Yes. You are checking with him, what shall I do, Lord? Which way to go? What shall I say? How shall I react? So personally, there are some examples. You spend time alone with Jesus. Fix a place, a time that you and Jesus have some intimate time. You know, relationships, spouses, boyfriend, girlfriend, they don't build relationship in a crowd. Yeah? You need one-to-one -one time. And this is separate time, dedicated time. You mean business. Focus your attention on Jesus. Wait, get the instructions. Some people have it in early in the morning, some people late. Whichever time you choose, stick to it. Commit to it. We, we abide in the true vine by reading his word, meditating on his word, speaking in tongues, that's a gift. If you haven't been, uh, you know, you're not speaking in tongues yet, you can ask God, he freely gives. You're communing with spirit, with spirit, deep calls to deep. Um, obeying his commands. If God said something to do, as difficult as it is, forgive this person. Please listen, obey. When you obey, you abide in the true vine. Although we know Jesus and we also come chain with Jesus, we know Jesus, right? Never, never forget to give him reverence. Remember, 
He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We give so much reverence to the young Deepak Patwan Akong. Yeah, we have to wear certain type of clothes. We have to, you know, bow. We must speak a, the, uh, a special way. Even with King Charles, if you're going to meet, there's so much of protocol. But when you come to Jesus, ah, yeah, Jesus, my friend, so what? Jesus can wait. <laughs> nah, he is the King of Kings, the yes. Lord of Lords. Yes. Give reverence where reverence is due. And he deserves the utmost, the utmost. Yeah? Worship God. Worship God. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Come early to church. Don't miss the time where we are giving God thanks and praise and worship. That is what you can give. Don't just come, oh, I want to get, get all the time. Come and give of yourself. We sang this morning, we bring a living sacrifice. We're worshipping Jesus. We're giving back. We're, we're showing gratitude. So all these ways, when we do them, we are abiding in the true vine. So one way is growing vertically, you and God alone. Another way is corporately, yeah, horizontally. And Bethel, I see you do a lot for Jesus. Jesus sees and may he be your reward. Don't look at Pastor Jerry, Pastor Yvonne to praise you. All those things that you do, arranging the chairs, coming early, week in, week, uh, week out, preparing the food, cleaning the toilets, rehearsing all the songs, cleaning this place, making sure the house of God is spotless. All those things you do in secret, God sees and God rewards. So look to him. Don't expect Pastor Jerry to pat your back all the time. Well done, well done, good, good, thank you. He is exhausted. Yeah? So, please, let's keep doing that. Bethel, you're doing marvelously. Let's Amen. aspire to do more. Amen. Uh, you give alms to the orphans. You're helping out with the um, Pakistani community. You're, you're feeding the elderly, the widows. That is amazing. This is what the Bible talks about. Serving, being Jesus' arms, hands, legs, heart. We, we also show that we abide in the Lord by giving tithes. Now, tithes is not because Jesus wants money. Everything you have, God has given you. God just wants you to, you to know if you are a good steward. Give back a bit. You determine what you want to give. Don't let anybody force you. Don't feel obligated. Because God loves a cheerful giver. Okay? And the seed that you plant will bless so many. And they will praise God because of you. Amen. And your reward in heaven will be great. Amen. But if you got the praise of men and the thank yous and you say, Oh, I gave so much. Uh, praise me. You got your reward already. You can also abide and be Jesus' arms and, and legs and heart by showing hospitality. You don't have to have a lot of money. You can invite someone home, give them a meal. You can pray with somebody, listen to them when they have a problem. It's so hard to listen to people and they've got so much to offload. When you do that, you're abiding in Christ. You're doing that because of Jesus. Everything you do, check. Motive. What's my heart? Is it because of Jesus or because I got an ulterior motive? Okay. Do you in your workplace when people swear, curse in Jesus' name, they use Jesus every time? Do you say anything? Does it grieve your heart? The name that is above, every name is being thrashed to the floor. Say something, ask God for discernment, speak up when you have to speak up. Yes. Fight for justice for the vulnerable, for the orphans, for the widows. Show mercy because you have been shown great mercy. Forgive those who have hurt you, this is a huge one. 
it's so hard to forgive. Okay, forgive life, forgive. But I cannot forget. How many times must you forgive? One time? Two times? 70 times 7. Not just 400. That means always, continuously, someone hit you or slandered you, gossiped against you, when they say they're sorry, you forgive. Forgive. Even if they don't, you just release them because that is God's command. Amen. Yeah? So, Jesus said to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So that's why we do all this. On this hangs the law and the prophets. Loving our neighbor means being Jesus to all you meet. When we abide in Jesus, there is a natural overflow. You do it automatically. When you leave a place, people say, hey, such a sweet fragrance. I met with Jesus. That's what we want our testimony to be. We demonstrate God's love in the way we behave, in our conduct. Taking communion is also a way we abide in Jesus. In the Gospel of John, Jesus revealed his deity seven times in I am statements. In Exodus 3, when Moses asked Jesus, sorry, when Moses asked God, what is your name? God said, I am that I am. I will be who I will be. God revealed himself as Yahweh, covenant-keeping God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, so the first I am declaration in the book of John is, I am the bread of life. Then Jesus went on to say, I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And finally, Jesus said, I am the true vine. So Jesus begins with, I am the bread of life, and ends with his last I am statement, I am the true vine. The Holy Spirit does not make any mistake in the order. We all know the first thing and the last thing mentioned is very, very important. I suggest to you that these are bookend revelations, meaning Jesus is underscoring to his disciples about Holy Communion the importance of bread and wine, the significance of this memorial in order to abide with him. You know at the Last Supper, Jesus said, take this bread. It is my body. Eat. So you eat on God's word. Chew, 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 chew. Meditate on it so that that word of God will come through your life. It will show up. This heavenly manner needs to be assimilated and it needs to work its way out of you. Jesus also took the cup, didn't he? And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant which was shed for many. We need to drink of the fruit of the vine to remember what Jesus, the blood covenant he cut with us. We abide in Christ when we partake of Holy Communion. So we know we have to eat his word, understand his word, live his word every moment of our life. And every time we partake of communion, we remember what Jesus did for us in the past, what Jesus did for us, and we appropriate all his blessings in the present, and we pray for his coming again. So regular partaking of communion helps us abide in the Lord. So what type of fruit pleases God? We talked about the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah, the nine fruits. I'm not going to go through that. We talked about good works. Good works with the right heart motive. Acts of service, 
compassion towards others, demonstrating God, Christ in practical ways. Jesus, God wants us to bear fruits in the sense of making more disciples, teaching people the word of God, not so much by our talk, more by the way we live. When people see the way we live, our behavior, they want to grow with the Lord more. So shine for Jesus. Please walk the talk. And another fruit that we bear, of course, for the Lord is personal holiness. Living a life that is set apart for God, marked by his righteousness and obedience to his command. So this all important last question I put to you. Why does God want us to bear fruit? This was his first command to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Father God is glorified when we bear fruit that resembles his son, Jesus. Now we know in the natural world, when a vine dresser or a gardener sows seeds and tends to the garden or vineyard, what will he come looking for? Hmm? If he sowed a rambutan seed, what will he come looking for after some time? Rambutan's fruits. If he sowed a durian seed, seven years later, what will he come looking for? Durians. Father God sowed his precious seed, Jesus. What he's looking for when he comes is a harvest of Jesus. More many Jesus, more Jesus fruit. Jesus said, by this the world will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. You know in Corinthians 1.13 it says, if I speak in tongues of men and angels and have not love, I have become a sounding gong, a clanging symbol. God said the greatest is love. Now, love is what we need to aspire for. That is our aim, our goal. If we love one another, the world will know that we are Christians. But what's sad to say, in our churches, Christians are fighting, Christians are living in discord, they're slandering one another, they're lying, they bear offense, they're unforgiving. This is in the church. What's the difference? We really need to work and ask God to prune us, remove the deadness, things that don't reflect Jesus. Because Jesus is the epitome of love. So don't let your carnal man resurrect every time somebody pokes you, ruffles your feathers. Ah! Don't. Okay? You need to ask Jesus, okay, God, how do I respond? And when Jesus tells you what to do, do what Jesus tells you to do. Amen? Uh, I want you to listen to a story told by a Cherokee Indian grandfather to his grandson. This is the legend about two wolves and who wins. Listen carefully. There is a legend I wish to share with you. It is said that a wise Cherokee elder was once teaching his young grandson about life. There is a war going on inside of me, said the elder. It is a war between the two wolves. One wolf is evil. He has anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. But the other wolf is good. 
He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. Then the elder placed a hand on his grandson's shoulder. This same war is raging within you and within the heart of every man, woman, and child. The young man was thoughtful for a moment and then asked, which wolf will win? The grandfather's reply was simple, the one you feed. I have learned that the point of life's walk is not where or how far I move my feet, but how I am moved in my heart. If I walk far, but am angry toward others as I journey, I walk nowhere. If I conquer mountains, but hold grudges against others as I climb, I conquer nothing. If I see much, but regard others as enemies, I see no one. Whether we walk among our people or alone among the hills, happiness in life's walking depends on how we feel about others in our hearts. We travel only as far and as high as our hearts will take us. If I was to move forward, I needed to leave all that was backward behind. Whatever you carry that invites a backward walking, leave it behind. Which wolf will win? The one you feed. So, if we abide in Christ, in the true vine, you feed your spirit man daily. You starve your carnal man. In fact, put him to death every day because he tries to resurrect. You become who you feed on. True vine believers are addicted to Jesus. The true vine disciples feed on the true vine, Jesus Christ. In him we live, in Jesus we move, and in Jesus we have our being. So in summary, Jesus said, I'm the true vine, abide in the true vine. Not the wild vine, not the false vine. Be addicted to Jesus. Not all branches bear fruit at the same time. So don't judge other people. Some branches bear fruit and some may seem to have no fruit. It is not their time. Fruit bearing takes time. Some fruit, tree fruits in a year, some three years, some seven years. Be patient. All branches in the vine will eventually bear fruit. God is faithful. He will ensure that all branches in Christ will produce fruit. God will eye roll branches that do not bear fruit and he will prune those that bear fruit. So every Christian will bear fruit, at least one fruit of repentance. Your hunger and thirst level in Christ determines the amount of fruit you will bear. Christians are disciples of Christ, followers of Christ. True disciples abide in the true vine. Non-abiding branches, the fake Christians, the non-believers, are cast away. They wither, are gathered, and thrown into fire and are burnt. True believers are hot for Jesus, addicted to Jesus, hooked on Jesus. They grow continually. 
They move forward and upwards. They are not stagnant. They make progress, move to higher ground. Bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit. So we brothers and sisters must go from glory to glory. He's changing me. Abiding in God's love means keeping God's commandments, doing his will. When Jesus' joy abides in us, our joy will be full. In John's Gospel, the two bookend deities of Christ is revealed. Here we have the first and the last. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. We have the memorial reminder of Holy Communion. Regular partaking of Holy Communion helps us abide in Christ. And lastly, Father God sowed his seed, his precious seed, Jesus. When he comes to the garden, he's looking for a harvest of more Jesus. God desires that we bear fruit that reflects Jesus, his character, and advances his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen.